This is Gareth Southgate, and this is the Three Lions Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Three Lions podcast. My name is Russell Osborne and this is an independent England football supporters podcast. Thank you very much for tuning in. How are you? Thanks for all the feedback on the uh, the preview episode. That went down really well. Thanks to Sani, Casper and Nick and also to Marco. In fact, Marco, he's uh he's found a oh, he's got a newfound fame. You may have seen him on Football Cops, the um, the Channel 4 Fly on the Wall series about Football Cops. Go and check it out. You'll, you'll see him. You'll know who I mean. Right, let's get this show on the road. Let's put that Iceland result behind us. This is, hopefully, the first of seven trips to Germany, unless I decide to stay out at some point. I know the longer it goes on, I will lose track of time and days and inevitably sleep. Because as I speak to you now, it's Saturday night and I'm waiting at a bus stop outside of Tesco uh, for a coach to take me to Stansted, for a flight to take me to Eindhoven, for a coach to take me to Gelsenkirchen to see England play Serbia in our opening Group C game. Ever since that win over Italy in October, our place in the Euros was secured and we've been planning routes across Europe. The 2nd of December arrived and we knew who and where we'd be playing. I'll have to just quickly say, tomorrow, Sunday, uh, is Father's Day here in England. So I apologise to my own daughter and to my own dad as well. Love you both. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of others in the, uh, the same situation. So this last week, the usual media stories have ramped up. This time, apparently, our game has been deemed high risk. Uh, as apparently 500 Serbian hooligans uh, are descending on Germany. And as it's high risk, only low alcohol beer will be served inside the stadium. But I have my passport, I've got my match tickets. Actually, just uh, whilst we're talking match tickets, those that have emailed me or messaged me asking me, how do you get tickets for the tournament? Well, this is the result of following England for a considerable amount of time through the England Supporters Travel Club. I, many others, I guess, yeah, have watched the side all over Europe. Those games against uh, Australia, Malta, those ones at Wembley, Austria and Romania and Middlesbrough. I think they contributed to this, uh, this caps period. Well, those caps all accumulate and the sort of those caps result in getting these group games for 30 euros each. Got to put the hard yards in. That's how it comes about. But the tickets are once again on an app, no physical match tickets, which is a shame for traditionalists like me. Got to move with the time, though. That's what they say. All right. How long until this coach is getting a bit chilly now? This is, It's got to be the worst summer or the worst start to a summer we've had in a, uh, a long time. I'm hoping that the weather in Germany will be a little bit better. So that weather that I left in England has sort of on and off followed me to Gelsenkirchen. Thanks to uh, Mark on the ball travel who's uh, got us from Eindhoven to here in Germany, Gelsenkirchen. Now, I've got to say, Gelsenkirchen, it's, it's not a place I've been to before. Apparently, it's twinned with Newcastle, Newcastle upon Tyne. And having only just been to Newcastle fairly recently, uh, the contrast, it appears, couldn't be bigger. 
basically on the on the face of it, it appears it's a a very small town. Being on a Sunday as well means there's not a great deal open, as is the way in Germany. Um, and I, I kind of get the impression the only reason that Gelsenkirchen is a, uh, a host city is because of the uh, of the ground, Schalke's ground, being of the standard that it is. Um, so I've uh, I picked up a, a copy of Free Lions, which is tradition uh, on an England away day. And whilst I was doing it, I spoke with one of the guys from the FSA who basically said there are only three pubs here in the town. And you have a quick look around, and they're all full anyway. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've taken a tram and a stroll up to the race course, which some of you may remember in 2006, the World Cup 2006. This was absolutely heaving with England fans uh, as, they, uh, as they watched some of the games. Um, and already now again it's heaving it's got that sort of festival feel to it there are three massive screens uh, dotted around this race course I say race course because it's got like a uh, a ring of sand around it and a grandstand um, but in the middle it's just a grassy area pretty uneven I have to say I've lost my foot in a couple of times um, but yeah there's a stage and there's these three screens loads of toilets Loads of sort of food stalls, beer stalls, dotted all around. Yeah, that is where I am at the moment. It's half time of the Netherlands-Poland game. Uh, it's just about to start the second half. It's one all in that one. Um, but yeah, let's, whilst, we're, whilst we're talking football, let's just touch on some of the games that have already been played. That opening game, Scotland. <laughs> well, they're... they're uh, had their shorts well and truly pulled down and, and spanked, didn't they, by Germany, losing 5-1. Embarrassing performance, you have to say. Even they'll admit to that. Tierney celebrating a, uh, a goal kick after four minutes was, was probably where they set their ambition out from the, uh, from the outset. And uh, I have to say, I did think um, that they might stand a chance of qualifying, maybe in one of the third-place spots. But with a... Uh, Needing a goal swing of four, I, I think even now um, they're out. I'm going to say it now, Scotland are out. Switzerland beat Hungary 3-1, saw bits of that. Swiss looked good. Hungary, yeah, a couple of moments, but nothing of the Hungary that we've seen in recent years. Spain thumped Croatia 3-0. kind of wonder, is that it for this Croatian side? Have they finally hit the wall? But Spain, though, they've got that player 16 years old um youngest player to ever appear in the euros tournament there's records being broken left right and center already with only what three four days um being played uh, as i say a record because the uh, the game later in the day italy against albania 23 seconds in and albania have scored quickest euros finals goal ever it would appear cracker great goal I remember being in Tirana when we played Kosovo four, four, five years ago, sitting in a square, loads of bars, all watching the TVs. I bet it must have really have gone off there when that goal went in. Italy ultimately scored two and won the game. So I'm going to see out the second half of this game in the race course here. And then I'm going to make my way to the ground for England Serbia. So here we are, finally made it. Came from the the race course ground, got the tram all the way to the stadium. I'm standing outside it as we speak. They're not letting us in just yet. So the tram was a uh, was a journey. Someone 
someone bought a massive speaker onto the tram and was playing basically now that's what I call England foot songs on it. And the tram was literally jumping. Really good fun. Really good fun. So here we are then. This is the arena Alf Schalke, home of FC Schalke. 50,000 seater for the Euros. I think it's usually about 60 plus, but I think because now they have to have it all seater, um, it takes it down to, to 50. But it hosts us and Serbia today, Spain and Italy. That promises to be a good one. Georgia and Portugal. And then they've got a round of 16 match. And this is where we could be returning if we, uh, if we win Group C. I think then we will face... I think I think we'll face either third place from either groups D, E, or F. Um, but it is here that we lost to Portugal uh, all those years ago, two thousand and six. Ronaldo and and Winkgate and all that. Yeah, let's hope for uh, let's hope for nothing like that today. But it is it is a venue that is sort of a glass exterior. Um, officially it's like the Veltins arena, I think, but where the sponsor is, they've just sort of like covered it over. It's got a white roof. And, and actually I remembered now this, it's a ground with actually a roof on, um, and you can see it from the outside where it sort of retracts like one way and the other. Um, but it's got all the, uh, all the UA for Euro 2024 branding on the, uh, on the outside of it. So. Not long to go now before we get ourselves inside and we can get it underway. Tell you what, this is a long walk around the stadium from where I spoke to you a moment ago on entrance F. And we have to walk right the way around the ground. And at points, you wouldn't even think you're anywhere near a football stadium. You're going through like a, uh, like some, a pathway through bushes and, and grassland past a school. There we are. Entrance F. We keep going. There are plenty of Serbians milling around. Obviously, plenty of other um, fans of other nations as well. I've actually seen a couple of Scottish fans, Scottish shirts, um, waiting to get into the ground. Be interesting to see who they're following today and whereabouts they might be sitting. And in we are. That was pretty harmless. Took a little while to get here or to get into the uh, the ground, find the gate. But once I was in, fairly straightforward. Found the plot, found the row, found my seat, and I'm just looking around. What is it? It's only probably two hours before kickoff, to be honest. But there are people already coming in. The roof is open. Uh, and so look up where you can see the open roof. There is a massive uh, TV screen, four-sided TV screen that is currently showing uh, Slovenia Denmark, um, and it's currently Denmark one nil. I'm trying to think back. Was it this grade that Paul Robinson smacked the ball and aimed for the for the TV screens, possibly in that game against Portugal? I can't remember now. I know he's certainly done it at some stage. But anyway, as I look around, there's blue seats all around, and it's got the, the, the Schalke 04 lettering in, in white seats on one side. I like it. It's got all the, uh, the UEFA branding, as you would expect, on the inside, and already there are a lot of England flags beginning to appear. In fact, there's one local to me. There's a Stevenage one over there. There's a Norwich one, Norwich one with a West Ham Hammers as well. Emerson Park, not sure I recognise that one. Crystal Palace up there, Aldershot, Burnley. Plenty of flags adorning the uh, adorning the stadium. I mean, there was a there's quite a uh, hurrah about the flags. Those of you that don't know, uh, the authorities decided in their wisdom that any flag bigger than I think two mo two meters by one and a half meters had to have a fire retardant um, certificate um, with it, which caused a right uproar with obviously many England fans. Um, 
because they, they haven't got these certificates. So they've had to sort of rush around um, and try and obtain them. And I can already see there are there are flags bigger than two meters by one and a half. So it looks like it's uh, it's all good. But I mean, I have to be honest. I've never seen a flag spontaneously combust before. So I'm not quite sure why the reasoning is to have a uh, a fire safety certificate for it. I'm sure UEFA will. Uh, I'm sure UEFA have their reasons. Right, I'm going to go and get something to eat, I think. Um, I've seen some uh, big old pretzels, um, which took my fancy. So I'm going to go and get that one. Hopefully by the time I come back, uh, players might be out on the pitch. We will see. An England team have just come out onto the pitch for a pre-match ball. Blue track suits, white trainers. On the big screen here in the uh, in the ground, they showed the uh, the coach bullying in. Like a helicopter followed it, um, like overhead, showed it pulling in. Gareth Southgate got off first, and the players on these big screens that were showing Slovenia, Denmark, are now showing Harry Kane. They're just all having a look around. Well, I imagine probably the majority, but probably a few of these players have played here before. Either Champions League or, yeah, or European football. I think Schalke as a team dropped down to the, is it the second tier of the Bundesliga? I think someone told me. So, I mean, Harry Kane would have played, uh, played against them. But yeah, they're just looking around, taking it all in. And here come the uh, the Serbian team, decked out in a uh, in a pale blue this time. And we have a lineup hot off the press. England have announced their lineup. Here it is: Pickford in goal, Walker, Rice, Stones, Gay, Saka, Alexander Arnold, Kane. Bellingham, Foden, and Trippier. That's pretty much as attaching as we can get, I think, really, isn't it? I <laughs> Well, morning after the night before, here I am, Eindhoven Airport. 1 0 win. Doesn't matter how they come. Three points is three points. Just got to get underway with a uh, with a positive start, and that's what we've done. And that has been the way regularly for England at tournaments under Gareth Southgate. You remember Russia 2018, we beat Tunisia 2-1. Euro 2020, uh, there was the 1-0 against Croatia. And in Qatar 2022, the 6-2 over Iran. So, yeah, we continue that streak of winning our opening game, which wasn't something that England used to do at tournaments. Um, so, yeah, bodes well. Jude. Wow, Jude Bellingham was immense throughout last night. He got man of the match. 
uh, and of course scored the only goal of the game following a cross from Saka, who, who I thought also had a great game. I mean, first half we dominated, but second half, I think it's fair to say we we looked tired and began to let them dominate at times. Um, Pickford made a great save towards the end. Harry Kane was out-muscled at times, surprisingly maybe. I think his only chance came from a from a header, wasn't it? I, I don't know if the keeper saved it or if it went against the bar, um, but basically it didn't go in. Um, we were calling for changes from the uh, from the stands, and, and you kind of think as a general rule of thumb, substitutions are often made on on the hour mark, and and that was really when they needed to be made. But Gareth seemed to to make them a little later, but job done. A win against Denmark after they drew, and yeah, we're through. Just want to say. I just want to say something on the national anthems. I know the Serb fans, they did begin to boo, but we sort of then outsang them with, with God Save the King. But then we replied with massive boos throughout their anthem. And the likes that I've really not heard for a long time just kind of seemed so unnecessary, especially given the fact that we never played Serbia before. Not a fan of booing other nations' anthems, I have to say, but there you go. Uh, as I said earlier, I was on Mark Griffith's On The Ball coach. Once everyone was on board, we were pretty much on the way, just gone midnight, back to Eindhoven for two o'clock-ish. I think we were the lucky ones because sort of speaking with other people and sort of seeing on social media... It seems it really wasn't as straightforward for many others. Stories of people being stuck at Gelsenkirchen sort of train platforms or tram platforms are still at two in the morning waiting for trams that wouldn't arrive. Um, and, I mean, as well, stories hearing that it was hard to get to the ground by some trams breaking down, I think, is what I could gather. It would appear that the infrastructure around the town isn't really, if it's a town, city, I'm not sure, isn't really set up for a game where the vast majority haven't been before. 50,000 people inside that stadium, I would say uh, 45,000 of those may have never been to that stadium, that area before. And you'd imagine that for a Schalke game, people, well, they can drive, they can walk, they know the best ways in and out. But as good a stadium as it is, I think UEFA dropped a big one there. Um, it just just didn't, they didn't have everything in place, put it that way, the authorities, UEFA, whoever is responsible. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, if we top the group, we'll be back there with likely the same issues, which... Which isn't encouraging, really, is it? But still, I have to say, at the end of the day, we got a result, and that was the main thing. Right, I think throughout the uh, throughout the, the the time we're out there in Germany, playing out there in Euro twenty twenty four, I'd like to hear from some of you guys your thoughts on the games. Um, you can do that by sort of recording a voice note, emailing it over to me at three lions podcast at gmail. Dot com. So let's hear from a few of you, your thoughts on last night's game against Serbia. Let's start with Ash. Hiya, Russ. I thought it was an OK performance from England, to be honest. First game of a major tournament, always a difficult one for Serbia. They were strong, they were aggressive for them. It was their World Cup final. And I thought England dealt with them well, hung on a little bit at the end. Bellingham, world class on another level. A few of the others maybe didn't play so well last night. But once again, a win's a win. Move on to the next game. Oh, and the organisation, absolutely terrible. For a country like Germany, to be organising that was shocking. Walking down the hard shoulder of a motorway, trying to get away from a football stadium with no lighting, 
at one o'clock in the morning, two hours after the game had finished. It's just terrible. Cheers, pal. Morning, Russell. Uh, Sam Goldsworthy here. Um, sending this to you at about 12.36 after only just waking up, after getting back to our apartment at 10 past five in the morning in Hanover. Um, I think we got slightly lucky getting away from the ground um, due to leaving the game early because we knew it wasn't going to be pretty, but we were hearing stories of people that were still queuing for trams at 2am. So the, the, the organisation of getting there was even worse and the organisation getting back was terrible. Um, so I think I can't think of anybody that's had a, a decent experience getting away from that game. Um which spoiled it really, because in terms of the game itself, it was a you know a great night and a, a good result from a, a fantastic you know Jude Bellingham goal, um, one that really sort of sets us up going forward in the tournament now. So hopefully on to Frankfurt now. Um, the games hopefully start to improve a bit, and hopefully the organisation is better in Frankfurt as well. Up the England. Cheers, Sam. Yeah, that great insight into the. The organisational nonsense that happened last night, first-hand account. Oh, perhaps I should really appreciate how lucky I was with uh, being on the coach and not being involved in that. Uh, nice one, Sam. Cheers for that. Uh, this is Mark. First half, we did what we needed to do. Belling was uh, wonderful. Um, took the goal great. Uh, Defence in the second half did what they needed to do, which was to de- defend. Proved all the doubters wrong. Hi, Russell. Gary here from Channel England Football on YouTube. It's three points and we'll take that. Very mixed performance. We're going to have to improve as the tournament goes on if we want any hope of winning this, really. But Saka was brilliant. Bellingham was brilliant. Gahey was really good. Pickford was good when needed to. Interesting, wasn't it, that the defence actually came out being the better side of England than the attack and all the talk leading up to this tournament was how good we are up front and how poor we are at the back. But on the night, it was the exact opposite. The defence was solid and the attacking players seemed to lack that bit of spark, really. Foden in particular was so poor. Trent was, he just doesn't fit in midfield. He needs to come out for somebody else. And Kane, you know, just didn't do anything in the first half. Didn't do an awful lot in the second half, neither. And I think it's worrying that he isn't willing to take him off. And I think it's the same old problems with Southgate in particular, where he's proactive, sorry, he's reactive rather than proactive. And he needed to make those substitutions a hell of a lot sooner. First 5, 10, 15 minutes of that second half, he needs to make the subs, but he waited until 30 minutes into the second half to do it. Um, and it, yeah, he's just worrying moving forward. But three points, we'll take that. Victory against Denmark and we're through. We're going to have to improve though, aren't we, if we've got any chance of winning this tournament. Nice one. Cheers, Gary. Uh, let's finish off with Chris. I'm not sure how else to describe it, apart from it felt like what other games for England in major tournaments feels like. An opposition that we probably should have beaten more comfortably, but instead scraped past. However, as you know, as my mate said to me, it makes a really good point. Before Southgate, we'd never won the opening game of a European Championships. And so actually even though it was a bit uncomfortable, it doesn't matter how we did it. We still won. We still got those three points. And we've now I've got a foundation to actually grow into the rest of the tournament, which hopefully is the case, but job done. And that's all that matters. Thank you very much, guys. Always appreciated. As I say, we'll do it for the for the foreseeable whilst we are still involved in the tournament for Denmark, for Slovenia, for whoever comes next. Uh, record a voice note, email it over to me, 3 Lions Podcast. spell it out, T-H-R-E-E, 3 Lions Podcast at gmail.com, uh, and I'll get you on the next episode. Right, I'm going to leave it there. I've got to get home, got to get some work done, got some family commitments. I will be back out for the Denmark game. Hope to see you there. Thanks for listening. Until then, take care. Cheers.